All right, off we go. We're, uh, uh, if you haven't noticed, make sure that you have. We're skipping chapter 9. Chapter 9 is covered in Physics 2. Um, it's one of the things to make sure that we do so that we can stay in sequence with at least RPI, if not some of the other schools, since that's where most of uh, my students tend to transfer. So we decided it's better if we cover gravitation, chapter 9, and, ch and physics 2. So we're going uh, we're gonna to take an awful lot of what we've already got and just extend it a little bit. In fact, we already have a little bit in some ways. We're going to look not just at particles and all the particle motion that goes on with those, but we're going to look at systems of particles. Uh, kind of a fancy name for any problem that has more than one thing in it. So far, mostly what we've looked at is, is one ball dropping or one car accelerating or uh, the, the, the most we had in terms of a system of things was we might have had a ball with uh, some elastic thing attached to it, but we didn't worry about the, the mass of the spring or its velocity or any of that kind of stuff. It was just still a particle is all we had in the problem. So now we're going to look at, at what can happen with a system of particles by that mean nothing more than we might have two or more things in the problem. They might be connected in that whatever one does, it affects what the other one does. That's certainly what we'd have. We had a couple things attached by uh, pulleys and ropes and the like. We want to see how those go. Uh, could be there's electrostatic forces of some kind between them. Uh, but for the most part, what we're looking at here uh, to start with at least are separate, distinct uh, particles, but there's more than one of them in the problem. So we'll take the, uh, the simplest one. Uh, most of you will notice Samantha is not here today because she, uh, she, she knows what was coming up. Uh, we're going to look at car crash as uh, two cars in a collision as our system of particles. And since she's the only one mad enough at me all the time to chase down my car and hit it, because there's my car. Anybody know what uh, what she drives? What she drives? Probably a pickup truck, a blue pickup truck, like a baby blue pickup truck. You probably think. I think she probably does. She probably drives. Um, there's there. Okay, there's 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 Samantha's car. Somebody take real good note. Oh, she can see the video. We'll let her see the video. Uh, so we're going to, this This is as simple as this can be. This is our system of particles. And we want to see what happens when one of them has a greater velocity than the other. Let me keep, uh, keep the same notation the book was using. Yeah, that'll do. Such that... Uh, V1 is greater than V2. Otherwise, they wouldn't collide. And that also works if V2 happened to be the other way and they still collide. This relationship, V1's got to be greater than V2. Just uh, kind of be in name all about it and make sure that they collide. If they had the same velocity or V1 is going slower, they wouldn't collide. Um, it's not a terribly interesting problem, though there's still some things we could do with it. So we're interested in that, that possibility when our two cars become one. We're going to start with the uh, condition that as they do this, as they uh, collide in this way, they do so such that they stick together. So we'll call uh, the single velocity they now have. Now they're not really a system of particles. Now they're a particle. It's a bigger one than it was before, but essentially it's just one particle. But they have a single velocity, and we'll call that velocity V prime. Now, for what we've got right now, analyzing this type of situation is is a little bit problematic. If we look at her car and what happened to it, 
because uh, we do know how to analyze a single particle. We've spent weeks doing that now. What are we, uh, about nine weeks into the, nine, ten weeks into the course, and that's all we've done is looked at single particle problems. So you'd think we'd be able to do something with this, and, and we can to a point. Uh, her car starts with some velocity V1. It's got some mass M1. We haven't talked too much about, uh, well, certainly we haven't said what that kind of thing has to do in this particular situation, but mass has had a lot to do with things as we've been going along here for a couple weeks. Some little bit of time later, she's got a, a, a brand new truck, had a little body work done. Now her truck is M1 going some velocity, some new velocity. In fact, there's been clearly for her a change in velocity. In fact, it's a uh, uh, I don't think you even need to have been in a crash like this to figure out that the velocity she came in with is going to be less than the velocity she's got now. That's just what happens when you hit the car in front of you. I think most everybody knows that. By the way, we're assuming neither one is on the gas at any time. All these velocities as pictured at any time are constant velocities. So this is the constant velocity all the way into the collision. She's not accelerating into the collision, just constant velocity. Then there's this collision, and we have what we'll take as an instantaneous change in velocity, almost instantaneous, very short time. Crashes don't take long. And her velocity will then be reduced to this. So, so we, she, has, she has something like that type of situation. We understand that for there to be a change in velocity, an acceleration, there must have been a force. Friends of yours, Alan? No. Let's know if we're by a minute. For her to have lost speed, for her to have decelerated, there has to have been a force opposite the direction of her velocity uh, to affect that. We don't know how big that force was. We sure know what caused it. What did? The car in front. She hit it, exerting a force on it. It hit her back. That's an action-reaction pair. That's Newton's third law. Anytime one thing has, exerts a force on another, the second thing exerts the same force and magnitude back on the first. So uh, she felt some force. E even if even if we don't know that those are an action and action pair, we do know there had to be a force like this in this direction to cause her velocity to drop. It just wouldn't happen any other way. We know how to do acceleration. We've learned that for weeks now. That had to have been the case. Had to have happened in some little amount of time, delta t. Let's see. We could even say, let's see. Uh, minus F, because we'll take going to the right positive, just because we always do anyway. So we know that minus F has got to equal M1 times, here I'll put in the, the, the intermediate part as we go, delta V over delta T, M1. Uh, her delta V was something like, well what? V prime minus V1. Well, remember, V1 is not uh, necessarily the first velocity. That's velocity of her as car number one. That's the subscript system we're using for today. And that had to take place in some amount of time delta T. God forbid you've ever been in a crash, but you know those delta Ts are pretty short. They happen real quick. Crash it, you know, sometimes on TV, they slow it down so they get the skidding and they get the glass shooting across and, they, and it's very dramatic and all and really drags delta T out for a while. But that's not what happens. The crashes are bang quick and then you sit there trying to figure out what happened. Then you're trying to figure out how can I blame the other person. 
quick. I gotta think up an excuse so that I don't. I'm not guilty for this. So uh, the analysis is there's nothing here that we haven't been working on for a couple weeks, other than the fact we're not going to have a very good idea what this is, and we're not going to have a very good idea what that is. Oh, we might have an idea, but if we come upon some crash, or if you're even in a crash, you're not going to be able to estimate for me what delta T was. You're probably not going to even be able to estimate what this is. Because don't forget, after you do this crash, and this is the velocity instantly after the collision, but instantly after, uh, uh, a little bit more than instantly after a collision, people put on their brakes and get out and see if everybody's okay. This is the velocity that instant after collision. Because after that, the brakes go on, the skidding happens, the, the, the panic, the heartbeat, the adrenaline, all the stuff's going on, the flashing lights, the people driving around you, laughing at you. Uh, you sucker, I'm going home, I'm going to get home in time. Uh, you jerk. I've, I've, I've been the, the first person on the scene three times at car crashes in Clifton Park. I was I was right there, saw the whole thing, was the first person there. My my immediate response was, I gotta see if I can help. I gotta I pull over, see can I go help, make sure nobody's bleeding to death. But I couldn't because everybody else who wasn't the first person there had to go by. They wouldn't let me across the road so I could go see if these people were okay. They were all in such a hurry. I had to wait there for them before I could go see if somebody's bleeding enough because they wanted to get home. Wait a second, I recognize the car now. It was you. It was me. you. <laughs> All right, so that's the situation we got here. Uh, nothing here in the physics we've never dealt with before except we've just got a lot of things. The F and the delta T, very hard to know what those are. It'd be great if we could get rid of those. Be done with them, get them out of the way since they're so hard to find. We could, there are ways to, to instrument cars that we can measure forces, and we can measure forces that happen in very quick times, but who goes into a car crash with a car monitor? I don't, some cars have uh, black box type things nowadays, and they may do some of this type of stuff, especially the Delta T, but how many cars have that today? Just the OnStar cars, I don't know what, I don't. But then I only get in crashes when uh, Amanda's out on the road. So, uh, so let's let's look at the other car. Let's see. We've got my car. Dang, that's a nice car. Here's my car. It's uh, it's red. It's candy apple red. The best car color there is. I was going to pop it. Oh, I know who it was. <laughs> Good luck passing this course. <laughs> so I'm, I'm driving along. Um, I check my rearview mirror every seven seconds like a good driver does. But in that 6.9 seconds, I wasn't looking. She came and got me. And so I also got a new car now. And I also underwent a delta V. In fact, uh, what was the nature of the change in velocity of my car, most likely? Yeah, I'm going to speed up. You get hit from behind. You There's a sudden jerk forward. In fact, that's why we have headrests on the back of cars nowadays. So when you get hit from behind and your head starts to snap back as your body and your car are jammed forward, your neck is protected from that very quick snapback called whiplash. Very painful, very hard to get rid of after uh, even a long time of therapy and, and neck braces and all kinds of ugly things. So uh, I underwent a delta V as well. And in fact, are these two delta Vs the same? Is my change in velocity the same, well, they're not even the same sign because she slowed down, I sped up. But would the magnitudes be the same? 
Not likely. Not like they might be, but if anything, I would think that even might be coincidence if they did. So uh, we better do something. Let's get. We'll call hers one and mine two because I was car two, she was car one. Uh, just to highlight the fact those might not be the same. It could be, but uh, might be very coincidental if there are. Uh, no doubt, I got hit from behind. I felt a force from behind. Uh, we know that anyway because there was a change in velocity, so there had to be a force. Blue cars get pink forces. Pink cars get blue forces. Uh, are those two forces the same? The delta Vs aren't. Are those two forces the same? Well, clearly not the same direction, but are they the same magnitude? Are those two forces? The force she feels slowing her down in the collision, the force I feel speeding me up in the collision, and remember we're only talking about the time of the collision. We're not talking about all the skidding to a stop afterwards that can go on. Are those two forces the same no. in magnitude? I've got a what? A yeah? A yeah? I thought I heard a no from over here. From here. From Yeah, they're the same. No, they're not. Yeah, they are. Yeah. No. Yes, you do. So, we'll take it with yeah. You know, this, this is, you know, just vote like this was a presidential yes. thing. Don't even think about it. Just, oh, he's handsome. I'll vote for him. This is something like that. Yeah. So we had a couple no's. Joey, did you vote? I hope not because I don't want you to talk with your mouthful. The carrot piece is all over my feet. <laughs> yeah, those forces are the same. Alan, you said yeah, they were. Why are those two forces the same? At least same in magnitude. They're opposite in direction, clearly, but same in magnitude. I already told you. That's an action-reaction pair. This is, this is uh, Newton's third law in its glorious full uh, display here. So that I'm not going to put a subscript on those Fs because they are the same. I'll handle the direction, but uh, I already did that. This one's going left, that one's going right. So this will be M2 delta V2 over delta T. Uh, same delta T or not? Do I need a little subscript on the delta T's? Sorry, John? They're the same in an instantaneous moment. Well, they don't even exist otherwise. Outside of that moment of the collision, those forces don't even exist. Right. They're not there. They're it's gone. The, yeah. Once the velocity has changed and the two are no longer changing in velocity, uh, well, we're, we're, uh, we're not letting any time go by here after the collision because so much other stuff goes on. All the skidding and the, and the mass is changing because parts are flying all over the place. And uh, all kinds of things are going on. So, uh, but maybe everybody dies, so nobody can hit the brakes, and then they continue like that velocity for a long time. So, if you feel better with that, positive thinking. That's you. That's you in that class. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> See. Oh, good thing I don't have a green, a green, uh, a green uh, piece of chalk because there's a tree up there. Oh, darn it. Uh, just to make things even worse. Uh, anyway, are these delta T's the same? Or do they need a little bit of, of delta T1 and delta T2? Same, same yeah, it's the same crash. They're both in the same crash. It couldn't be the case that, that one of them is out of the crash and the other one isn't. They crash, they stick together. That's that's their past, present, and future as far as we're concerned now. So those delta T's are the same. The F's are the same. 
Uh, it's the masses and the delta Vs that are different. So let's let's do this. Let's do this. Uh, I'm going to take the first equation there. Minus F. Just multiply through by delta T. That way I've got the F I don't know. I've got the delta T I don't know and I've put them together. The two troublesome things are put together to separate them from the rest. It's what your elementary school teacher used to do with you and the guy you talked with all the time. She sent down both out in the hall. Uh oh, Joey, does that sound familiar? Were you a talking turtle? See, they, didn't ever, they don't do that anymore because the, the self-esteem issues. But when I was a kid, man, you talk too much, you're out in the hallway with a sign on your back that says, I'm a talking turtle. <laughs> Sitting out there in the hallway. Everybody's walking by. Oh, what's on your back today, man? Bad senior year. So, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, high school. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that leaves uh, equals M1 V prime minus V1. Oh, I didn't finish this because we know what M, we know what delta V2 is. Well, I do. What is delta V2? I didn't quite get this finished. Then we'll take it over. What's delta V2? V prime minus V sub 2. V2 minus V prime minus V2. What's our rule with delta? What's it always mean? Uh, the, the, the latter minus the earlier. The latter minus the earlier. Which one of the velocities came later? V prime. V prime. So this is V prime minus V2. That's V prime minus V1. So those delta V's aren't the same. Should the V primes be different? What was V prime? The velocity of the two now stuck together. This is not a bounce off collision. This is a collision where they stick together. Um, I knew she was coming. I had a bumper made out of bubble gum. So when she came in, that way, because uh, I knew she'd leave the scene of the accident. So this way, she was captive. And I could then call my lawyer and the police. They'd come in. They got it. I like it when Samantha's not in class. It's a lot more fun, isn't it? <laughs> I'm not putting up this video. <laughs> All right, so, so we've... Uh, <laughs> We've, we've got that there for her. That's her, that's her uh, uh, collision equation, if you want to call that. Then we can do the same kind of thing with my collision equation. I was plus F delta T. Um, right? Same F delta T for both of those. We don't need subscripts there. And I was M2 V prime minus V2. Well, the F and the delta T, the two things we don't know, they're very difficult to find, real hard to know about. Uh, the, the, the mass of the car, that's no trouble to know. It's right there on the registration sticker. Uh, we could get the V1, the V2, and the V prime maybe from uh, a closed circuit television if, if they happen to crash in front of we, we could estimate the speeds off the velocities. Uh, if both cars had a black box, we might be able to do that. So these, these are possible to know. That's not that big a deal. In fact, we could do stuff in the lab that does just that. We could figure out. You might have done that kind of thing in... Uh, in high school physics lab, done some cart collisions either on air tracks or with uh, kind of roller skate carts. They smash into each other and you measure their times and the like. It's not that big a deal. So let's, uh, let's do the easy thing. Let's add the two equations together. Minus F delta T plus F delta T, that's, that's zero in my book. And we need a calculator for that side. This side then is M1 V1 prime uh, V prime minus V1, and I'm, I'm I'm adding them together. 
M2 V prime minus V2. Fair enough? All right, let's do, let's do a little algebra, because that's not all this workable. Um, let's make this minus M1 V1 plus, no, minus M2 V2. M1 V prime plus M2 V prime uh, I'll take the V prime out, I get M1 plus M2 V prime. Is that all right? Just a little bit of algebra there. Just uh, What I'm doing is collecting the terms. Because notice now I have here terms before the collision only. And here, terms after the collision only. And in fact, I've got a minus sign on both of those, so I'll take them over to the other side, and I get M1 V1 plus M2 V2 equals M1 plus M2 V prime. That's pretty neat, because those are things, those are all things that aren't all that hard to come up with. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe the, the camera saw my car, so we got my velocity. Then the camera saw our velocity. From that, then I could calculate her velocity, which of course she would have lied about anyway, but now we can nail her. Couldn't I do that pretty easily? If I had my velocity before and after, I can figure out what her velocity is no matter what she claims in court. We could come on an accident scene, analyze the accident scene, and testify in court as an expert at 300 bucks an hour. There's a lot of engineers out there making this kind of money as forensic accident analysis engineers. They're called upon by uh, one party or the other, usually their uh, their uh, uh, insurance company, saying, "Here's the data. Can you tell us who's at fault, so we can go to court, sue the other insurance company?" And the engineer will take it. Could, we could we could come up with this based on the skid marks. If we knew how far they skidded and we knew the coefficient of friction, we could back out of that the velocity just after collision, couldn't we? That's no different than the stuff we've been doing for a couple weeks now. People can't hit us and lie anymore. We're too smart now. Because we can look at the data. I know what the skid marks were. I know what the coefficient of friction of those tires on that kind of pavement are. I know how fast we were going after the collision. I know our two masses. I know what my velocity was. I know what you were doing when you hit me. I want compensation. I want a new candy apple red car. Pink. I want a new candy apple red car. And, and red chalk to go with it to sh shut up the naysayers over there. Yeah. yeah, you're so far away you can't see. That's pretty useful. The two things we couldn't deal with, the force and the time, are out of the problem. And just some things that are pretty easy to deal with are in the problem. Now, uh, we also, well maybe you notice, there's a, there's a combination of variables we haven't had before that's recurring here. It's mass times velocity, mass times velocity, mass times velocity. Just about any time we have recurring variables, we ask ourselves, do we have something here that is important enough as a combination 
that it's a good time to throw in a new name, a new variable letter, to screw with the students' heads a little bit more. That's what we think in physics meetings. We've got this combination m times v. Let's call it something. Give it a new letter that doesn't make any sense. Piss off the students. That's the essence of teaching. That stuff you hear about the light bulb going off, that's bullshit, man. It's, it's when, when your eyes start to cross and spin around and blood dripping out of your ears, that's teaching. <laughs> that's, that, that's when, okay, that's when, oh man. I live for those moments. So, we've got this combination recurring of m times v. We know v is usually a vector. Should it be here, you think? Are we dealing? Yeah, because we could have had the possibility that they're going one way or the other, and we might need to account for that, especially if it was a head-on collision. We were going towards each other. We need to account for that. So this this is a vector quantity. In fact, it kind of makes sense. You know there's something fundamentally different between you and a Prius going 60 miles an hour and one of those lumber trucks coming down from Quebec going 60 miles an hour. There's just something fundamentally different about those two things on the highway that makes us feel both mass and velocity are indeed important especially in how crashes play out. That lumber truck could go right over the top of that Prius and he'd go, hmm, there was a little bump in the road, wasn't there? <laughs> dum -dum. That's all he'd know, there was, was that little tiny bump. Or he'd go, ah, oh, so can't believe that this little bump is a world. But I, I need to get home. So, so uh, that's not, that's kind of, you, that kind of makes some sense, that there's mass times velocity that makes some sense. And in fact, uh, there's got to be a big difference between two cars going the same way and hitting, going head on and hitting, hitting at a 90 degree angle or any other possible angles in between. So it makes sense that this is some kind of vector quantity because uh, we know that the direction can have a big thing to play in, these, in a lot of these type of problems we've been looking at for several several weeks here. So we define that, that uh, product, mass times velocity, as, who's got it? Somebody knows it, I bet. Tyler? Who remembers it from high school physics? Phil does. Phil? It's momentum. Momentum, a term you've all heard. And so, of course, we need to give it a symbol because it's way too much work for us to write m times v all the time. We need just a single letter we could write because we don't want to work this hard. So, what do you think? What would be a good symbol for it? Q, X. P. P would be a great symbol for it. P. Momentum. Until you get to dynamics, then it becomes a G. Unless you use a different book, then it becomes an L. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm okay with it not being an M. We've already got an M here. Um, I can write a big M different from a little M, but half of you couldn't. So it would be disastrous if we used an M. So we'll use a P. Momentum is defined as the mass times the velocity, the vector velocity, the full vector velocity of a vehicle. Oh, of a particle. Doesn't have to be a vehicle, all the particles. So, um, so let's see, what have we got here then? Uh, M1 times V1, well that's, that's P1. M2 times V2, that's P2. God, Len, thanks for paying attention today. I appreciate it. Anytime? Almost. Okay. No, I'm not I almost, almost caught you there. Uh, equals, what's this then?
Yeah, maybe P3. It is different than either one of these, isn't it? Um, we'll put it into words then, and we'll, then we'll worry about a symbol. What is that? Is that a momentum? And if it is a momentum, it's the momentum of what? It's the momentum of the two vehicles together, because that's what we've got after the crash. So we can call this P, well, we'll call it P prime. That was our symbol for after the crash. Remember, immediately after the crash. Not time for skidding and deceleration and panic to go on. Immediately after the crash. Um, could be a vector. Uh, this was a one-dimensional problem, but we, we were concerned with whether it was left or right when we set up the whole thing. In fact, that's, that's where all these minus, not all the minus signs, but the, uh, that's where this came from. The fact that we could do this is because we were concerned with the direction of things and how it was going on. We were paying attention to that. So this, this uh, we, we, we're not losing anything by calling that the vector. If it's one dimensional, we just use plus and minus. If it's two dimensional, oh, we'd have to use i and j. Three dimensional, we have to do it i, j, and k, but it's all still, it's all still fundamentally the same. In fact, not only can we say that, what more could we say about P1 plus P2 as a quantity itself? No? There's, there's nothing to integrate here because I don't have any, any DTs or DVs or anything. Just the two added together. Here's P1. That's the speed, the momentum of the blue pickup before crash. This is what? Excuse me, can't you have red before crash? This is the momentum of that awesome, great looking car before the crash. So it's, a, it's actually the two particles are still independent of each other, but we are adding them together. So what is this? Total momentum. There's more to it than that. Total momentum of what? When? Total momentum of the system of two cars before collision. This is the momentum before. What's this in words? This is the momentum of the whole system before collision. This is the momentum of the whole system after collision, not during collision, because during collision this change in speeds is going on. We don't know exactly what that is, because notice V prime, uh, well V prime is still in there, uh, but, but how that happens in that incredibly short period of time, we don't know any of that. This is just the instant before collision, the instant after collision. In a collision, the total momentum before equals the to total momentum after. That's useful. In a collision, the total, the, there's no change in momentum of the system. Whatever the system momentum was, stays the same. Now, uh, there's, there's a little bit of a subtlety to this, but not too big a one. Remember what the deal was with this minus F and the plus F? This was the force on one car, this was the force on the other car. But they were equal and opposite. Not only that, they're equal and opposite and they're essentially inside the system. Those are not forces outside the system. It's not the force 
of the great hand of God coming in and plucking Samantha's car off the highway, which the police should do probably, but we may need God to do. It's not the force of, of any air resistance or any skidding on the road, or it's, the, it's only the interaction of the two cars with each other inside the system because of the collision itself. That makes those two forces that are equal and opposite an internal force. They're internal to the system. So if we look at the system as a whole, those two forces add together, cancel each other. We don't even care what they are. A collision is, is an interaction between particles such that all of the forces doing all of the changing, because there's a lot of change going on here. Speeds are changing, cars are crumbling, all kinds of nasty stuff is going on. The forces are internal and they cancel. There are no external forces, at least as we see it. If we let the if we let the post collision period stretch out a bit, yeah, there's lots of forces. They're skidding and and there's always wind resistance. We let time go by in the real world, but in that instant of collision, for our purposes, all those forces are internal and they cancel. No external forces. No matter how many particles. Yeah, because if there's more cars in the collision, if it's a multi-car collision and we take them all as a system, all those forces are still inside. Now, yeah, things are a lot different if it's a, if it's a chain event of crashes like, like they always have in the, in the in I-5 in California where they plow into each other and 60 cars are going in that crash. That, that takes a long time actually to develop. That's, that's uh, several seconds, maybe 30 seconds for that many cars to be in a crash. An awful lot can go on. Remember, we're talking about the instant before collision, the instant after collision. And so for our purpose, we'll only do two particle collisions here. But if three happen to hit at the same instant, there'd be no change in this. Four hit in an instant. I mean, the man that goes out and gets some friends and, and chases me down with all of them. <laughs> she, I mean, man, well, I keep saying Amanda. <laughs> I said, oh man, don't tell her. Please don't tell her I said that. This bow, I'm editing this tape. I know I have a, I have a, Amanda's her friend, the other driver. They're all woman drivers. Who can, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, no external forces. If there are no external forces, as there are in the collisions we're going to look at, the momentum before equals the momentum after, or delta P of the system equals zero. If it's not changing, we add before and after together zero. In the absence, of external forces on a system, momentum is conserved. Maybe you've heard of conservation of momentum. There it is right there. One of the most important ideas in physics is the conservation of momentum. If you go into the study of fluid mechanics, fluid dynamics especially, this will be one of the most important things you'll ever look at. Conservation of momentum. All right, let's uh, let's put some numbers to it just uh, just so we can see how it deals out. Just for funsies, because there's nothing more fun than looking at car accidents. 
Also get used to some of the numbers and some of the magnitudes that we might say might see. So who who was M1 was uh, was uh, Samantha's car, right? The the little blue pickup. I thought it was only a small pickup. My car, my car was 1,100 kilograms. Mostly that's because of the metal flake paint. I used. It kind of looks pink sometimes, but when you look up close, it's really candy apple red with a gold metallic flake in it that's just is heavy. So that's why my car has a lot of mass. In case you were wondering. Real gold. Real gold. I'm insulted that even needed to be brought up. <laughs> 32 meters per second. Way over the speed limit. Probably texting at the time. <laughs> 17 meters per second. So find out for me in this situation V prime. Just just to work through the numbers a little bit. Not hard, real simple. And of course, I want you to double check your units. So let's see, uh, let's just make sure we understand what the units are on momentum. Nothing more than calculate the momentum before. We know that'll equal the momentum after, the instant after collision. We can use that to find out what uh, V prime is. But you come in on an accident situation, you probably know what V prime is. You, first thing they do in an accident, but, well, first thing after they make sure everybody's okay, they bring out the tape measure, measure the skid marks, record the, uh, uh, the Ambient conditions, was it raining or snowing? Uh, is that a gravel road or a pavement, asphalt or concrete? They write down all that stuff because they're gonna go back into their car, open up their laptop and put all that in and out comes the, well internally it does the coefficient of friction. Calculates all this stuff for them. They all have laptops in there now. Talk about who's texting while they're driving. <laughs> Oops. You think after this, all this time, I'd be used to the camera running. But no, man. they're all like, you fix it by you just do the rest of the front front access. Was it that? That was good. You got to at least save that part. All right, we're all doing the same problem. Maybe we should get the same number. So if you've got something, check it with somebody. If you're on the speaking terms with anybody, Alan. Not yet. Bill, nobody recognizes Bill. This is Bill. He's the guy who always wears a hat. That's the reason you don't recognize him today. And have a hat on. I think I've ever seen your hair. Have I? I don't know. Probably not. I know less about your hair than I know about mine. What's that number? Everybody agree? <laughs> okay, we got some agreement. What's it look like? Len, what'd you get? 23.8 meters per second. Simple as that. And that's the that's the kind of thing that they try to get out of measuring the skid mark length and the tapes and recording the coefficient of friction and the like. Then they'd be able to figure out just how fast Samantha had been going. Uh, oh, do this. Do this for me. 
let's check something else. See if it's true or not. Do this for me. Find out the kinetic energy. We don't need that. Uh, kinetic energy of the system before and the kinetic energy of the system after. Calculate those two things as well. And then we're going to do a line of a, a units wrap up so we make sure we got everything here. together because after a collision that's what they are so I'll put M big T for total that's M1 plus M2 times what? V prime squared. V prime squared. Okay. Make sure it doesn't look like V to the 12th because that's wrong. Make it look like V prime squared. So that's pretty easy. Uh, how do we do the kinetic energy before collision when they're separate? Yeah, just calculate the kinetic energy separately. Add the two kinetic energies before collision. Energy uh, in all its different parts in the system just adds together. Remember, we were doing that with with spring potential, gravitational potential, kinetic. We just add them together when we got more than one. So this is Ke one before. Plus Ke two before one half m one v one squared plus one half m two v two squared. Remember, in this case, the one and the two don't mean before and after. The prime means after. We have two different cars going here, ones and twos. So our our system of particles. We just add stuff together. At least energy and momentum, we sure do. All right, get some numbers on those. I need uh, I need two more things: kinetic energy before and after. So get those two numbers. Check with somebody when you agree. Relax. The chances have just improved that you're right if you agree. If you don't agree. Sort it out. Take it outside.
you could start looking at whatever forces are acting on it. Oh yeah, now 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 that we now that we know what m delta v is on one side, that's got to be equal to f delta t. However, we know the product f delta t now, but we don't know what f is because we don't know what delta t is and vice versa. So we know what that product is, f delta t. We don't know what the parts are of it individually, but we're going to need that f delta t in a little bit. In fact, you're going to need it when you go home today. And we'll see it roughly in this year. Some point in the answer. I wrote All right, we've got lots of agreement on these numbers. Tyler, who, oh, now you check. Mike, who'd you check with? Check with somebody else. Jeez, you could wait all day for Bill. You guys agree? Mark, Andrew, Patrick, who are you checking with? Me? Text, text Alan. Say, Alan, what'd you get? Say, Alan, what'd you get? Ask Andrew, he's right here. Okay, okay, okay. Len? Goodness, what is giving you the trouble? The times or the square? All right, let's see what we got. Um, first thing, let's double check here. What are the units on MV? Momentum. Well, uh, yeah, obviously, let's see. We got kilograms, meters per second. Obviously, that's mass times velocity. Oh, by the way, in reports, when you write these reports for me, don't do this square bracket thing around the units. I'm doing that at the board as I analyze the units. But remember, every time I ever put a graph or something like that, if I have here, I just put S there, maybe in parentheses, or put the units right on the thing. Don't use these square brackets. And usually in, in writing, that means something else entirely. It's usually used for when you have references in your reports. So I saw that a couple times in the, in the reports. Uh, what else does this equal? Because that's not the only thing it equals. If you remember, over here, when we first had it, we had minus F delta T equal uh, delta P. That was of the first one, right? The one with the minus was the first car. Check back to your notes. We had that. We had it right up here in the corner here. Only I had minus F delta T equals M1 times V prime minus V1. But that's delta V1. And M1 delta V1 is P1. Wow. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the units for momentum, which we just got, must be the same as these units. What are these units? Yeah. Newton seconds. seconds. Right. Newton seconds. So these are the same. You can double check that, take out newtons, put in kilogram meters per second squared, then they're the same. So those are the units. Um, you could come up with other combinations, but that's plenty right there. Um, so what's the kinetic energy of the system before collision? Or round it off. 620 kilojoules. Is that right? What was the kinetic energy after collision? Something 566, something like that, right? Was energy conserved? No, most certainly not. Uh, in fact, a good chunk of energy looks like 
Uh, about a sixth of it was lost. Where'd it go? Because when, when we were doing the work energy equation and there were internal forces, how much work's done by internal forces? How much work's done by internal forces? None. Internal forces are equal and opposite. They cancel. They're not pertinent to this situation. So there's no work being done. Remember now, picture in your mind the work energy equation. There it is. It's beautiful glory. If you haven't gotten your tattoo of it yet, you put it right here because it would fit there in case you need it. Work energy equation, there's no forces, no external forces, so there's no work. Why isn't energy conserved then? No. There is no work if the left hand side of the work energy equation is zero isn't the right-hand side of the work energy equation zero? So why is there a change in energy when there's no work being done and there shouldn't be a change in energy? This is just kinetic energy. There's other things going on. There's places where that energy is going. Where is that energy going? It's being stored up and bending that metal. If these cars were made out of bouncy springs, which would be awful fun, then they'd hit and they'd bounce off each other. We'd get that spring energy back. We'd get the kinetic back to the kinetic energy. Energy would then, uh, uh, the, the kinetic energy, we could get restored from the spring energy. But we're, a lot of this kinetic energy is going into the deformation of the metal, the breaking of the glass, the heat and the noise that's generated, and it's all lost. Energy is conserved. It's just a lot of the kinetic energy is taken out, put somewhere else, and is unrecoverable. We haven't looked at unrecoverable energy before. We could always get that spring energy back. We could always get that potential energy and the gravitational potential energy back. This energy we can't get back. This energy we've lost. All right, what else can we do with this? Um, well, we can do the very same calculation, I guess, with, uh, with the two coming towards each other. Well, let's go ahead and do that. Let's, let's say same speeds, same masses, but this time I knew Samantha was on the highway. I figured the best thing to do is turn around, go back the other way, figure in, you know, the way she drives, there's no way she's going to be on the highway. She'll be up on the sidewalk or something. I'll be safe going back the other way. So I'm going the other way, that speed. Now it's a head-on collision. Now what's V prime? And now what's the kinetic energies before and after. You can do that real quick. You know all the units. You know, uh, you run through the equation, you should be able to do that real quick. Same thing, only this time I'm going the other direction before the crash. Now I want to know what happens after the crash. We'll assume we still collide and stick together. I want to know which direction are we going after the crash and what the kinetic energies were. So, 
same situation. Only what changes? Anything? Yes, yeah, some, some stuff changes. Just do it. Just, just think there. This is not exactly the same problem. But not everything changes. Should be almost done. You're used to this calculation. Should be quick. Already know the units work out okay. This is a, a pretty easy one when we're doing momentum before and after. As long as we got the same units, they're automatically going to work out. So we wouldn't want one in kilometers per hour and one in meters per second. That'd be disastrous. Got something, Phil? Check with anybody yet? Check with Alan. Alan's done. In fact, Phil, you know, if you sat in between, then you could work with Len and Alan. And those the days when Mike's kind of sleepy, you wouldn't get all scared. You wouldn't check with him? It's going to get a bad grade on, 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 on works and plays well with others. Very, he's going to get a minus. And then not even get a check mark. Certainly will get a plus. I'll just do it twice to compare my results on myself. What? I'll just do it twice to compare my results with myself. Yeah, nobody ever makes the same mistake twice. Anybody agree yet so we can get going? people at least yeah. to agree. Let's go. Anybody agree yet? Yeah. Okay. We've got some agreement. V prime equals 5.05 meters per second. 5.1 meters per second. We'll call it just to be uh, quick here. 5.1 meters per second. Uh, in fact, who had more momentum before the crash. Without calculating momentum of each, who had more momentum? Just look at that result and tell me who had more momentum before the crash. Remember, the momentum doesn't change in these collisions. Here I have a positive velocity, meaning what? Did anybody get a negative here? 
I have a positive velocity. This is the two cars together. So now we have plus 5.1, little tiny arrow. My momentum, or our momentum, is to the right. Going into the collision, I had momentum to the left. If we finish with the same momentum we started with, we had to have started with a total momentum that was to the right. So who had more absolute momentum, magnitude of momentum? Car one did. Because if that's all the momentum to the right, and we still ended up with momentum to the right, then she had to have a lot more momentum going into the crash. If we had the exact same amount of momentum as each other, what would our velocity be after the crash? Zero. If we had the same mass, same velocity, we hit and stop instantly. Or if we had a combination of m times v that was equal, we'd hit and stop. Since we end up with rightward momentum, we know then that her momentum was greater than my momentum, uh, absolute value. The police could look at that too, just look and see which way the cars went after the collision and instantly know which one had the greater momentum. Just based only on the direction the crash, uh, the, the coupled cars went after collision, they instantly know who had the greater momentum. How about the kinetic energies? What do we start with? Same as before. But wait, no, no, no. One car was going the other way. Doesn't matter. You square the velocity. So direction doesn't matter in kinetic energy. What was it? 566? Oh, yeah. No, there it is right there. 620. What was the total moment, uh, kinetic energy after collision? It's hardly any now. We lost a whole lot more energy. Where'd all that extra energy go? Same place it went the last time, only an awful lot more of it. Which collision would you rather be in? Bimped from behind or head on? Same speeds. Wouldn't you rather be bent from behind? Who, uh, how many people ever you hear get killed because they get bumped from behind? A lot of people get killed in head-on collisions because there's so much more energy that goes into the collision itself. There's that much more deformation, that much more damage. Those cars and head-on collisions, you've seen them sometimes. There's not much car left. That took a lot of energy to do that kind of damage. And there's, there's the energy right there. An awful lot of energy. All right. Uh, oh, that's good. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll take up with more of our system systems of particles then on, uh, on Monday. Very useful tool. Imagine if you had 15 cars in the court. But for our analysis, they ought all be the same. That's right. That's right. That's right.